So I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm a clinical senior lecturer in bipolar disorder at King's College London, and I work clinically as a consultant psychiatrist in early intervention in South London. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a recent meta-analysis published in the Lancet Psychiatry, um, which, is invest which is summarising the evidence on treatments to prevent relapse in bipolar disorder. It's uh, a multiple treatments meta-analysis, a network meta-analysis, it's combining data from a wide range of randomized controlled trials, and it's got really high quality methods, interesting implications, and really, I think, advances our understanding of how best to manage um, bipolar disorder in the longer term. I think the great strength of the analysis is there's been a very thorough search for the evidence, so it's been very comprehensive in its inclusion, um, and then the analysis that's been undertaken is to the, really the highest level. It's very robust and thorough. There's a high quality paper, but there's also an online appendix to provide far more information and background on those methods. It's all very explicit and clear. Um, in terms of the conclusions, what's quite striking is it reinforces an awareness that's been around for a few years now that really lithium has a very strong evidence base in bipolar disorder. Um, that's been reinforced with its inclusion in recent trials, but also there's emerging evidence for other agents with a constellation of different, different um, strengths and weaknesses in terms of prevention of depressive and manic episodes. So it's a very interesting study, and it's the kind of thing I'm going to be trying to use in thinking about longer-term treatment choices with my patients. I think the great clinical implication is that it provides a rational basis for choosing between different treatments for different individual patients. We've known for many years now that people have different propensities to depressive relapse or manic relapse, and what we're trying to do is to tailor the treatment to the patient. Um, and what this, this analysis shows us is really quantitative evidence to let us give, have an informed discussion about the benefits and risks of different treatments for different people, which is something we've been crying out for for many years, and we finally have that in a very accessible form. So that's extremely useful. In terms of limitations, the real problem is the um, evidence base which it is summarising. We've got high-quality evidence for a wide range of treatments as monotherapy, but in practice, we often use combination therapies, more than one thing together. And the evidence for combinations is much more limited. There have been fewer studies done. So we know that some combinations work very well, but in practice, we often end up going beyond the evidence base. And what we need, I suppose, is more evidence to inform us about those treatments that we use, the combinations we use in real clinical practice in a way that we currently can't, um, we currently aren't informed by really high quality trial data. So in treating bipolar disorder, we often have to distinguish between treatment of acute episodes of illness, whether that be bipolar depression or episodes of mania or, or mixed episodes, and then longer term treatment choices. And we often use similar treatments in both the acute phase and the longer term phase. One thing that really strikes me, comparing the results of this analysis with previous network analyses for the acute treatment of bipolar disorder, is there's a real similarity in the prevention effects that one sees in the longer term relapse prevention with the relative strengths of different treatments in the acute phase. So when one looks at the treatments for treatment in an episode of mania, the relative magnitudes are very similar with the effects we see in prevention. So the acute phase treatments are really almost predicting or are, are correlating with that maintenance treatment effect. So I think it's very interesting in terms of mechanisms and approaches to understanding bipolar that we've got a real similarity here backed up by high quality clinical data to say that the acute phase treatment and the maintenance treatment presumably have a, a lot of similarities somewhere in terms of the, the processes driving that. In practice as clinicians, we work with them as part of teams and what we're offering is holistic care. At least that's what we all, I think we all aim to offer, the combination of pharmacological interventions but other treatments too. And this evidence really informs our choice of pharmacological strategies. But of course, that's only one part of comprehensive high quality care. And we know that there's increasingly strong evidence that delivering that kind of expert pharmacological management within a broader context where you're delivering, for example, high quality group psychoeducation has a real additional benefit in terms of preventing relapse. So I think what many of us on the ground are trying to do is to incorporate this kind of high quality evidence about medication choices in part of a broader strategy to improve services more generally, providing access to psychoeducation, other evidence-based psychological interventions and other um, aspects of a broader um, care coordination and psychosocial strategy for patients. So it's one part of treatment of bipolar disorder. I think it's an important part, um, and I suspect without high-quality medication management, it's difficult for some of the other interventions to show their benefits. 
But I think the real gold standard has to be an integrated approach where you're combining psychosocial and these pharmacological strategies for the individual in a, in a personalized fashion. One thing that's very interesting when we look at this in a, in a wide context is there's always been a, lot, a great deal of variation between different, different countries in what kinds of treatments have become popular, become widely used. And I think as we're getting a stronger evidence base to guide our treatment choices, we should hopefully be seeing um, a convergence on a more similar treatment approach. I think what we're now seeing when one compares, for example, British guidance with European or worldwide guidance is, a, is an increasingly great deal of overlap in terms of the kinds of recommendations for treatment that are being made, which I think is very reassuring. It, it, it makes sense to tailor treatments to the individual patient. It's always slightly concerning if it seems to be driven more by the, the particular clinician and you know, where they happen to have, have, have been working or, or trained. I think it's interesting within the UK to see the strength of evidence we still have for lithium in the prevention of, of, of relapse in bipolar. I think in many countries around the world, lithium rather fell out of favour, and some of the reasons for that um, weren't entirely evidence-based. I think there's, a, there's an issue in the, within society that people, lithium can be seen as a slightly stigmatising treatment by some people, and that can be off-putting. I know when I talk about long-term treatment, or people are very concerned about starting lithium, um, I think when we've got evidence about what they can expect in terms of the benefits and the risks of lithium treatment, we can make a choice together that's based on really high quality evidence now. And that's really, I think, what we need to have a good discussion so we can make the right treatment choice.